So, we might be getting closer to finding a massive icy planet beyond Neptune's orbit. Yeah, sorry Pluto, still not you. Recently, some universe mapping using data from a telescope in Hawaii eliminated about 78% of the possible locations for this mysterious Waldo from space. Some people call it Planet 9, while others prefer Planet X. Either way, it's been causing controversy since its existence was first proposed. And that is mainly because no study so far can answer the big question – does it really exist? If discovered, Planet 9 would rank as the fifth largest planet in our solar system, with a mass 10 times that of Earth. It's also theorized to be gaseous, like Uranus. The initial study on Planet 9, dating back to 2016, suggests that this colossal new planet orbits the Sun 29 times farther out than Neptune which sits at about 2.8 billion miles. As a result, the planet 9 would take between 10,000 and 20,000 years to complete a single orbit around the Sun. If confirmed, this yet-to-be-understood world would dominate a region larger than any other known planet in our cosmic neighborhood. These are all intriguing hypotheses, but without a single piece of evidence or observation to back them up. Before dismissing this as a wild guess, it is important to note that these researchers relied on complex mathematical modeling and computer simulations to speculate about the planet's characteristics, because that's what they do. The hypothetical presence of this planet would explain various mysterious features located beyond Neptune. We are specifically talking about the Kuiper Belt, a huge donut-shaped region filled with icy debris left over from the formation of the solar system including comets and dwarf planets, like Pluto. What happens is that the six farthest objects in the Kuiper Belt exhibit elliptical orbits that are all oriented in a similar direction within physical space and tilted approximately 30 degrees downward relative to the orbital plane of our eight known planets. What's strange here is that, despite their distinct orbital velocities around the solar system, they maintain this alignment. The likelihood of such alignment occurring randomly is extremely low, around 0.007%. So here comes Planet 9, a hypothetical massive celestial body that offers a plausible explanation for this strange phenomenon, potentially exerting gravitational influence to shape these orbits. The initial theory didn't hold up for long, facing accusations of observational bias and calculation errors. Then, in 2017, another study popped up, sparking back the idea that maybe Planet 9 is out there after all. This time, Spanish astronomers tried a novel approach, focusing on observing extreme trans-Neptunian objects. These celestial bodies orbit the Sun in highly stretched elliptical paths, with average distances exceeding 13 billion miles. The research suggests that the distances between these objects' nodes and the Sun might provide clues to Planet 9's location. You see, these nodes are the points where a celestial body's orbit intersects the solar system's plane. When these objects reach these points, they're more likely to interact with other solar system bodies, potentially causing significant changes in their orbits or even collisions. So, if the trajectory of these extreme trans-Neptunian objects remains stable, everything's fine. But if it's not, well, that's a sign that something else, something big, is messing with their path. And that's exactly what the research found. There is something unseen out there, throwing these objects off course. And that something could be a planet chilling at a distance between 300 to 400 times farther from the Sun than Earth. To this day, the study of the extreme trans-Neptunian objects is the strongest evidence we've got for Planet 9's existence. And if you're still not convinced by this theory, know that strange motions like these have led to planetary discoveries before. Neptune, for instance, was spotted because Uranus's motion didn't quite agree with the predictions of Newtonian gravity. But the deflection of its orbit could be explained if it was caused by a pull of an undiscovered planet. And just like that, we discovered Neptune. Now, the year is 2021, and there's all this buzz about Planet 9 again. After correcting some old guesses, 
studies are now leaning towards the idea that this mystery world follows an epic loop around the Sun every 7,000 years. That is massive news, because it means this planet might be closer than we ever thought, making it easier for our telescopes to spot it. The paper also suggests there is a whopping 99% chance that the funky orbits of these distant objects are all because of this unseen planet, not just some cosmic coincidence. Now, the odds of this whole situation being a fluke are down to a 1 in 250 chance, which is much better than the 1 in 10,000 chance back in 2016. All these optimistic numbers have brought us to where we are today, keeping our hopes and working on better equipment to continue the mission of spotting Planet 9. As mentioned earlier, researchers in Hawaii created some kind of treasure map utilizing the Panoramic Survey Telescope and Rapid Response System to eliminate 78% of its locations. This is great news, considering how challenging it is to find a planet-sized needle in a cosmic haystack. But unfortunately, Planet 9's presence remains a ghost in the dark outer reaches of our solar system. Enthusiasts are still convinced of its existence and believe it is only a matter of time before we celebrate the discovery of Earth's new cosmic cousin. They're putting their hopes on the Verici Rubin Observatory, which is currently under construction in Chile and is scheduled to begin science operations in late 2025. Over the course of 10 years, this observatory will scan the entire southern hemisphere sky every few nights with a 27-foot, fast-moving telescope equipped with the largest digital camera in the world. The idea is to catalog everything in the solar system, reaching out to and beyond Neptune, and tracking the movements of millions of celestial objects, including space junk, asteroids, comets, and stars. If Planet 9 is indeed out there, this next-generation telescope could be the one to find it. The existence of this mysterious planet is far from being universally accepted in the scientific community. That is simply because Planet 9 isn't the only explanation for the strange phenomenon occurring beyond Neptune. One theory suggests that a group of distant objects, such as dwarf planets, comets, and moons, might be collectively influencing the orbits of the extreme trans-Neptunian objects. Others believe that a black hole is behind all this. These compressed masses are some of the densest objects in the universe, potentially capable of affecting the orbits of other masses, like how this supposed ghost planet 9 is believed to be doing. Another bold perspective suggests that our current understanding of the laws of gravity is flawed, actually incomplete. This theory, known as modified Newtonian dynamics, proposes that these distant icy objects exhibit strange behavior not due to influence from another planet, but rather because the immense gravitational field of the Milky Way is influencing them. However, even supporters of this theory acknowledge that it is too early to draw firm conclusions, and much more extensive research is still required. While we continue our relentless hunt for Planet 9, some astronomers have taken it a step further suggesting the existence of a hypothetical Planet 10. This world has a mass and size like that of Mars or Earth and is located on the edges of the Kuiper Belt. But the thing is, if this alleged Planet 10 is indeed as small as scientists believe, it might not have enough gravity to clear its orbit of debris. And that is pretty similar to what happens with Pluto, being one of the reasons why it got into trouble back in 2006. So yeah, it's better not to get too excited. This supposed Planet 10 might end up classified as another dwarf planet. For thousands of years, people knew only about the planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, which they could see using simple telescopes, or even by the naked eye, if conditions were good. But in the late 18th century, a famous astronomer named Sir William Herschel discovered a new planet that was icy blue in color. At first, people thought it was a star, but later they realized it was a planet. Today, we know it as Uranus, a planet that's more than 19 times farther away from the Sun than Earth. It's so far away that it takes Uranus 84 years to complete one trip around the Sun. This astronomer also discovered many other interesting things in space, like double stars and nebulae. 
In the mid-1800s, scientists noticed something pulled Uranus and strangely tugged its orbit. They thought there must be another planet out there, and they used math to predict where it would be. Finally, in 1846, they found Neptune using a telescope. It was too faint to see with the naked eye because it was too far away from the sun. It was all so exciting. Who knows how many other planets could be there lurking in the darkness of our solar system. Back in the mid-1800s, astronomers noticed something unusual was happening in the sky. A small rocky planet named Mercury was behaving strangely. It didn't follow the predictable orbit that was expected of it. One of the astronomers was a brilliant French scientist named Urbain Le Verrier. He came up with a theory that there could be another planet in our solar system no one had yet discovered. It would be located somewhere between Mercury and the Sun. This hypothetical planet, which he named Vulcan after the Roman god of fire, would have an incredibly hot surface. And it could be a potential explanation for Mercury's strange behavior. He never surely claimed Vulcan was really the one thing disturbing the orbit of Mercury. But, excited by the possibility of discovering a new planet, astronomers all over the world took the idea of Vulcan. For a planet that didn't exist, people committed to developing ideas and getting information about it. Some scientists didn't think it was likely that they had missed another planet as big as Mercury. It would have been hard not to see it by then. But there was a tiny chance of a smaller planet existing inside Mercury's orbit that was too close to the Sun so no one could see it. One theory said it was about 13 million miles away from the Sun. Mercury is the planet with the most eccentric orbit in our solar system, but the closest point it gets to the Sun is about 28.5 million miles. This means Vulcan would be under half of that distance. The theory moved on, saying that if Vulcan existed, it would orbit the Sun every 19 days and 18 hours, and its path would be tilted about 12 degrees relative to the path of other planets in our solar system. Vulcan's position at its furthest point from the Sun would still be too close to the Sun to be seen with the naked eye, even during twilight. The only chance of seeing Vulcan would be during a solar eclipse, or when it passed in front of the Sun, which, as the theory said, would be two to four times a year. They had a theory that this mysterious planet was so close to the Sun that it could only be seen during a total solar eclipse when the Moon blocked out the Sun's blinding glare. So, every time there was an eclipse, scientists would peer at the Sun, hoping to catch a glimpse of Vulcan. They were trying really hard, but no matter what, they couldn't find this mysterious planet. Some astronomers claimed to have spotted it during eclipses, but no one could ever confirm or find evidence for that. The theory of Vulcan was left waiting for some better times. Einstein had a different idea. You know about his theory of general relativity, right? That's where he claimed gravity wasn't some sort of natural force, but a result of space-time curved because of the presence of giant space objects, like planets and stars. Planets circle around the Sun in their usual orbit because space-time is curved. That means the planets are kind of falling towards the central star of our solar system. And Einstein tried to explain Mercury's unusual orbit using his own theory of relativity. Unlike the other planets in our solar system, Mercury's orbit wasn't that circular. Instead, it seemed to wobble slightly, as if there was an invisible force pulling it away. Einstein said this could be happening because the massive gravity of our Sun was actually curving the fabric of space-time around it. He claimed it's possible this changed Mercury's orbit a little bit. It took the scientific community a while to test this theory, but it eventually seemed like the most plausible explanation. Even though Einstein's theory gave us a more elegant explanation for Mercury's strange orbit, some scientists were still holding out hope for Vulcan. It was especially hard to let go of the idea of Vulcan because Mercury is also the planet that's really hard to see from where we're standing. But later, more and more scientists started accepting Einstein's theory above their imagination. And they would observe a total solar eclipse specifically to test Einstein's theory of relativity 
not because of Vulcan. And Vulcan is not the only hypothetical planet everyone was talking about. In the newer age, some believe there could be a mysterious planet lurking in the outer part of our solar system. But this one is more likely to exist. No one has seen it directly yet, but computer simulations show this so-called Planet 9, or Planet X, is probably somewhere there beyond Neptune. Neptune and Planet X could be similar in size. Planet X could be 10 times more massive than Earth and circles around our Sun in an elongated shape, which is on average 20 times farther from the Sun than Neptune. A year there may last between 10,000 to 20,000 Earth years. By comparison, a year on Neptune lasts 165 Earth years. Something this big moving out there beyond Neptune could explain the unusual orbits of smaller objects in the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt is the area of our solar system beyond Neptune and where it orbits. And there are most likely many asteroids, comets, and some other smaller bodies there, mostly made of ice. There was another hypothetical planet called Nibiru. Remember those rumors that the world could end back in 2012? One of the popular scenarios was Nibiru, which some claimed would hit our home planet at the end of the year. Of course, nothing happened. We're still here, all set and good, but the idea of Nibiru seemed interesting. Stories started in the 1970s when a man named Zachariah Sitchin mentioned Nibiru in his book, The Twelfth Planet, claiming it orbits the sun every 3,600 years. But there's no chance a planet with such an eccentric orbit wouldn't disrupt other planets in our solar system with its gravity. And if it was really coming that close to Earth in 2012, we were supposed to be able to see it with the naked eye. Some simple calculations showed Nibiru would have been nearly as bright as Mars at its dimmest and brighter than the faintest stars you see from a city. Oh well, maybe we'll have more luck in the next 3,500 and something years. In 2011, a comet named Elenin appeared that many people thought could be Nibiru. But when you're looking at comets and planets through a telescope, you see they appear differently. A comet has a coma, which is a gas atmosphere, together with a tail, something a planet doesn't have. Plus, this comet didn't slam into the Earth. It came too close to our Sun and fell apart. The leftover pieces will continue moving on their way to the outer solar system for the next 12,000 years. Our universe is full of both amazing and terrifying things. You already know about quasars, black holes, dark matter, and so on. But how about the horrors of space that you haven't even heard of? Would you like to visit the most bizarre worlds in the universe? And it's not me who made this list but NASA themselves. Welcome to the Galaxy of Horrors, NASA's awesome Halloween collection. Please join me on a journey to some planets and tell me which ones you would consider the most horrible. Buckle up. Our first destination is a gas giant called Tress-2b. It's located 750 light years away from us. If we used a regular spaceship, it would take us about 10 million years to get there. Tress 2b orbits a yellow dwarf, a star similar to our Sun. It also weighs about 1.5 times more than Jupiter. So, what's so special about it? Well, if you're afraid of the dark, you definitely don't want to visit this place. It's the planet of eternal night, the darkest one of all the planets known to us. But it's not that far from its star, so why is that? The thing is, the surface of Tress 2b reflects light even worse than coal does. Because of this, it seems that there's no light at all. If you were flying across the surface of this planet, it would be like walking with a blindfold on your eyes. Oh wait, actually there is some light. An eerie deep red glow surrounds the surface of the planet. This glow is created by the burning atmosphere, which makes Tress 2b a scorching planet. The air there is even hotter than lava. Oh, but if you think that was bad, let me show you the next place of our horror journey. NASA wasn't beating about the bush while nicknaming this one. Now, we're not just talking about one planet, but three at once. They're also located quite far away. 
2,300 light years from the sun. We would have reached them by ship in about 35 million years. All the planets are in the constellation Virgo, and each is extremely light, much lighter than the Earth. These three exoplanets are called Poltergeist, Dragger, and Phobator. <laughs> cool names, huh? It's because each of these planets is about to become a ghost soon. The thing is, they don't revolve around a star, but around a pulsar. Pulsars are rotating neutron stars with an extremely powerful magnetic field. In simple words, these are the stars that exploded one day. After the explosion, they usually emit such a powerful pulse that it causes the star to rotate at an unimaginable speed. Several thousand rotations per second. At the same time, they constantly emit electromagnetic pulses that affect everything around them. So, you've probably already guessed what's happening with our zombie planets. They're slowly, gradually being destroyed under the gigantic influence of radiation. One day, they'll disappear without a trace. Ghost-like planets orbiting an undead star? Yeah, zombie world is a fitting name. It's also not surprising that scientists nicknamed this pulsar Lich, despite the long official name. Well, at least these guys stick together on their final dance. This planet has a long name, so bear with me. HD 189733b. This gas giant is 65 light years away from us. It would have taken around 1 million years to get there on a spaceship. HD, um, well, this planet is slightly more massive than Jupiter and orbits its star, an orange dwarf, all alone. At first glance, it may seem friendly. A pleasant blue color and curls on the surface. Kind of resembles a summer sky or foam on sea waves, right? Oh, looks are very deceptive, my friend. This planet has a pleasant cobalt blue color due to the hazy blowtorched atmosphere. This atmosphere contains silicates that condense when heated. In other words, the clouds on this planet have rain made of glass. Yes, it rains hot glass shards here. Oh, and if that's not enough, there's a raging wind on the surface, which is moving at a speed of 5,400 miles per hour. Just to compare, the fastest wind on Earth had a speed of 254 miles per hour, about 20 times weaker. And because of this, hundreds of thousands of glass shards rush horizontally across the planet's surface at breakneck speed. I really don't envy anyone who would want to try to land there. By the way, this isn't the only example of strange rains in our universe. For example, it rains molten iron on the planet Domitium. Or let's take so-called carbon planets. Their existence hasn't yet been proven, but if they do exist, there would be tons of black poisonous clouds and it would rain pure gasoline and hot liquid asphalt. Oh, and also, raindrops would explode upon touching the surface. Eh, nothing special. The next planet, though, is actually really strange. It didn't just revolve around its star, it lived inside the star. This cosmic miracle is called Koi 55b, or Kepler 70b. This planet is very far away from us, 4,000 light years. It would take about 70 million years on a spaceship. It's twice as light as Earth and fully rotates around its star in just a couple of hours. A long time ago, it was an ordinary Earth-like planet about the size of Jupiter. It was peacefully and calmly orbiting its red dwarf star, Koi 55. But everything changed about 700 million years ago. Perhaps you've heard that in a couple billion years, our sun will begin to expand into a huge star, absorbing everything in its path. Well, this is the fate of red dwarfs. Sooner or later, they increase, turning into incredibly hot blue giants. The same thing happened with Koi 55. This star began to increase in size and heat up in temperature, gradually turning into a blue-white giant. It was ready to devour its nearest planets, but Koi 55b didn't care about it. When the star reached it, this planet just settled inside. And moreover, after some time, it left its star, simply returning to the new orbit. How was that even possible? Life inside its star turned Koi 55b into a red-hot round stone. It's one of the hottest planets we've discovered so far. The temperature on it reaches 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hotter than the sun, which is, let me remind you, an actual star. And for some reason, it's still alive and lives as if nothing happened. 
Unfortunately, sooner or later, the planet will disappear anyway. It's slowly evaporating itself due to the incandescent atmosphere. But still, it somehow managed to survive the journey through the star. Which isn't typical for regular planets, to put it mildly. I envy this willpower. However, not all planets are so lucky. Some are gradually being destroyed by their stars, and there is even an entire system among them. This last planet is a sad loner. It's located 870 light years away from us. The journey by ship to it would take about 25 million years. This planet is about 1.5 times more massive than Jupiter. This is a very sad, dark planet. A doomed gas giant, which is very similar to hot Jupiter, orbits its star all alone. At the same time, it's located so close to its star that its orbital period takes just one day. Of course, because of this proximity, the star gradually absorbs WASP-12b. The scorching heat of the star is slowly destroying and devouring the planet's atmosphere. The planet has only around 10 million years left. But what's more interesting, because of this stretching, WASP-12b acquired the shape of an egg. It doesn't even resemble an actual planet anymore. It's also very hot. The surface temperature of the gas giant reaches 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, a spectrograph of cosmic origin, or COS for short, found that the planet exchanges matter with its star. They're located so close that they give each other part of their chemical elements. This is a common phenomenon in closely spaced binary star systems, but this is the first time scientists have seen this in a star-planet relationship. What a unique system! To be honest, if I was guaranteed complete security, I'd be excited to visit at least some of them. What about you? Please let me know in the comments. TRES 2b, or not to be, is a planet where night never ends. And it's not your regular night with stars shining in the beautiful skies. Here it's pitch dark and scorching hot. TRES 2b is a gas giant, roughly one and a half times more massive than Jupiter, and its surface absorbs light better than charcoal. It might also have a faint dark red glow because of its burning air, which is as hot as fresh lava. Lovely. In the star system of 55 Cancri, there are five planets, four of which are gas giants similar to Jupiter and Saturn. But the fifth one, or rather the first because it's closest to the star, is different in a most horrible way. 55 Cancri E is so close to its sun that half the planet's surface is a literal ocean of molten lava. The other half is in eternal darkness because it never sees the sun. The planet is always turned to its star on one side. And between the scorching and the dark, there's the twilight zone, a thin strip of gloomy nothingness. That's a getaway spot. HD 189377b, well, I'm not going to say that again is the only exoplanet in the orbit of its star. And at first glance, it looks quite pretty. Blue and white swirls making up wondrous patterns on the surface. But these pleasant colors actually come from hard silicate particles in the planet's atmosphere, which means it rains glass here. But the worst is that winds reach the speed of 5,400 miles per hour, or almost Mach 7. Well, for comparison, the fastest wind speed on Earth was 254 miles per hour, over 20 times less. Thus, the glass falling from the sky travels horizontally at hypersonic speeds, shredding everything in its path. Better duck! The next system, whose name I won't even try to pronounce, um, this one, has three exoplanets, which are all being slowly destroyed by their own star. It happens because that star is not a regular. It's a pulsar, a rapidly spinning core of an exploded star. It creates powerful electromagnetic pulses in several directions while rotating at several thousand times per second. As a result, the planets orbiting this deceased star are slowly being eaten away and will eventually disappear entirely. Kepler 70, hey, I can say that one, is a hot blue dwarf star that exploded into a red giant some 18 million years ago. At the time, it was orbited by at least two planets, the closer of which was a Jupiter-like gas giant. Its name was Kepler-70b, and it still exists. But the overgrown star consumed it and transformed it into a blazing hot rocky world. Right now, it's one of the hottest planets ever discovered. 
its temperature is higher than the surface of our sun. It was lucky to survive spending time inside the star, but it's evaporating now and will probably be no more in the near future. WASP-12b is one of the weirdest and saddest planets out there. The enormous gravity of its star, combined with the planets consisting mostly of gas, result in the star slowly devouring its protege. Uh, so pal, like, uh, what's eating you? My mother. WASP-12b has already taken the form of an egg, stretched toward its merciless sun, and it's unable to do anything with its condition. In another 10 million years, the planet will inevitably succumb to the voracious star's appetite. Hey, you asked. If you ever wondered what it's like to walk on ice and hot coals at the same time, Gliese 436b is a planet that would give you a vivid example. Being extremely close to its sun, the Neptune-sized exoplanet boasts temperatures hotter than a blazing oven. And yet, it's covered in ice, which burns incessantly. This ice is much denser due to the enormous gravity of the planet, staying solid even under extreme conditions and not melting away. No list of frightening worlds could do without mentioning Venus, the Earth's evil twin. <laughs> the second planet from the Sun has an atmosphere so thick and full of clouds that its surface is much hotter than that of Mercury. Volcanic eruptions constantly thrash Venus. Its gravity is almost a hundred times stronger than ours. And those clouds I mentioned are not made of water, but of sulfuric acid, which condenses and rains down on the ground, adding to the inferno. But even if you were brave, or crazy, enough to try to pass through these clouds, you probably couldn't. The winds up there are as strong as some of the most powerful hurricanes back on Earth. Here we have a very long name for a very, very cold planet. Although the host star is not too far away, it's a small and rather cool red dwarf, whose light and heat barely even reach the planet. The temperatures out there fall as low as minus 370 degrees, which is only marginally warmer than absolute zero. The exoplanet is thus dark, gloomy, and covered in eternal ice that never thaws. I thought I thaw that, Thumworth. Still, if it has a rocky core, it might generate some heat. So there's a chance that deep below the frozen surface, some unknown alien things might lurk. Dimidium, located roughly 50 light years away from our solar system, is a planet hostile to any living thing on many accounts. It's tidally locked to its sun, which means one of its sides is always facing the star, while the other is always turned away. The hot side is heated to over 1,800 degrees, perpetually blown over with winds reaching 600 miles per hour. And that's winter. Well, actually, I don't know that. Despite Dimidium being a gas giant, it has a large amount of iron in it, which melts and evaporates in the atmosphere, creating clouds. And when those cool down, they fall on the surface in the infernal rain of molten iron. That'll test your metal. Oxygen is usually viewed as an element that might bring life to a planet, but this is definitely not the case for Osiris. Scientists were shocked to find oxygen on this planet, or rather around it, because it's eight times closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. This extreme distance makes Osiris a living melting pot, where anything that could burn will. It's also responsible for a very short orbit of the planet around the star. A year on Osiris is just three and a half days on Earth. To boot, the atmosphere of the planet is constantly blown and melted away by the heat from its sun. Vacation? Nah, let's keep looking. Karat Exo 3b is neither as hot nor as cold as some of the others on this list, but it's terrifying in its own more insidious way. It's a gas giant similar in size to Jupiter, yet 20 times denser. This makes this exoplanet's gravity weigh down on everything on its surface 50 times more than it would on Earth. Stepping on it would be your ultimate doom, because you'd be immediately crushed by the density of its atmosphere. Karat 7b is another oven-like world. Its day-to-day -day temperature is over 4,000 degrees. Combined with the rocky surface, it presents an infernal landscape. The rocks on the ground bubble and boil, evaporating in the atmosphere where they cool down and eventually fall back on the surface in a brimstone rain. The saddest thing about Karat 7b is that it might have once been a gas giant 
whose atmosphere melted away from the heat, leaving only the scorched core. Dark, mysterious, cold space. Comets, asteroids, planets, stars, and something that's lurking over there, far beyond Pluto. Yup, this could be the ninth planet of our solar system, the one people have been wondering about for centuries. IRAs, which stands for the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, collected interesting data back in 1983. It could be proof that Planet 9 is hiding there. No one knows if it really exists, but this discovery helped to build a model to understand this potential planet better. And in 2016, scientists found out that some small space objects in the Kuiper Belt were orbiting a bit oddly. The Kuiper Belt is the outer area of our solar system. It's a ring in the shape of a donut, filled with leftovers from the times when our solar system was forming. You can find this donut beyond Neptune. The objects in that region of space have weird orbits, almost as if a big body with strong gravity is pushing them away. Knock knock, Planet 9 again! The theory says it might be 5 to 10 times the mass of our own planet, and up to 20 times further away than Neptune. The astronomical unit equals the distance between our planet and the Sun. Pluto is approximately 40 astronomical units from the Sun. But Planet 9, if it exists, is 400 to 800 astronomical units away. It would take 10,000 to 20,000 Earth years for this mysterious planet to make a single circle around the Sun. This makes it harder for us to catch this space body. There's a theory Planet 9 may have formed between the orbits of Jupiter and Neptune, similar to the rest of the gas giants in our solar system. The gravitational force of one of the two huge planets probably kicked it out of its orbit. Oh no! Then Planet 9 could get ejected further away from the eight planets we know about. It ended up as some sort of icy waste, quite small at the beginning. But as time went by, Planet 9 has cleared its orbit of frozen pieces of rock and dust and finally formed into a real planet. Another theory says that this could be a planet another star lost on its way while it was passing near our solar system. In any case, Planet 9 probably doesn't reflect that much sunlight since it's so far away. And astronomers aren't sure where exactly they should look for it. Space is dark, mysterious, endless, obviously. But if we do find Planet 9, it will be the first solid proof there are more planets in our solar system than we thought. Moving on to an interesting exoplanet, located only 90 light years away from us. An exoplanet is generally a planet located outside our solar system. This one has an atmosphere with water clouds. One year there lasts 24 Earth days, and the planet travels around a red dwarf star, which is way dimmer and smaller than our sun. That's why, even though the planet is 8 times closer to its star than we are to our sun, the temperature there is similar to that on our planet. This exoplanet has a size similar to Neptune. It's also less dense, which means it's mostly made of gas, unlike Earth, which is made of rock. The average temperatures there is 140 degrees, which makes it one of the coolest small exoplanets we've ever discovered. And the cooler the exoplanet is, the bigger the chance we'll find clouds in its atmosphere. Researchers have discovered more than 4,000 exoplanets, but all of them have been found within the Milky Way, at least until now. For the first time, astronomers may have spotted a planet outside our galaxy. They called it M51 ULS 1. Hmm. The planet is located in the Whirlpool Galaxy, a distant spiral galaxy 28 million light years away from us. There was once a huge but pretty young star that got stuck in a gravitational dance with something that could be a dense neutron star, the collapsed core of a giant star, or a black hole. The star's dance partner had incredibly strong gravity. It was feeding on the star, greedily ripping away its plasma. Then something unusual happened. An unknown, maybe even Saturn-sized object passed by and blocked this confrontation from our solar system. Now no one can see what is going on. But this could potentially be the farthest planet we've ever discovered. There's a newly discovered planet outside our solar system. As large as Jupiter, it orbits two stars. And, as we can observe it from our planet, it crosses in front of them both. The full circle around these two stars, which means one year, takes approximately 200 Earth days. On the day of the discovery of the previous planet, scientists also found it had an unusual companion. It's an extra-hot Jupiter with an ultra-tight orbit around its star. 
the year there lasts only 1.9 Earth days. This planet has a weirdly shaped orbit. Also, it travels in the opposite direction from the rotation of its star. If you could travel 57 light years away from our planet, you'd see something pink lurking in the darkness. As you get closer, it becomes bigger and more fascinating. Yup, it's a magenta-colored planet. A few billion miles away from its sun, this guy is one of the youngest planets scientists have discovered. It's only 100 to 200 million years old. It's made of pink gas, similar to our Jupiter. So if you could fly closer to its surface, this gas would envelop you like a thick fog. You're coming closer and going deeper, and the gas is becoming darker, getting a reddish shade. And look at the planet's core. It's super hot. Because of its high temperature of 460 degrees Fahrenheit, this planet is like an oven. The heat is the reason the planet glows so brightly. You'll also notice the sky is hazy pink, with clouds made of droplets of frozen water, similar to ours. There is another exoplanet half as massive as Earth, which is one of the smallest planets we've ever found outside our solar system. It has a diameter of 5,600 miles. For comparison, Earth's diameter is 7,900 miles. The planet in question is mostly made of iron, similar to Mercury. Mercury has a massive iron core and a very thin crust, which makes it an oddball in our solar system. At its early stages, it collided with some space body at least once. That collision pulled its outer layers away, which is why only the firm iron core remained. Maybe this exoplanet participated in a huge space crash too. That's what probably took away the planet's mantle and left mostly its iron core. Or maybe this is just a remnant of a gaseous planet that used to be the size of Neptune. The atmosphere of the planet could be blown away by, let's say, a huge amount of radiation coming from the star. This planet is only 31 light years away from us, and the day there is less than 8 Earth hours long. The planet is only a little bit bigger than Mars. People aren't likely to ever settle in that place because of its extreme temperatures that go up to 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. There might even be molten lava on the side of the planet that faces its star. Such temperatures are high enough to evaporate any atmosphere, so this planet might have had one in the past. Generally, gas giants like Jupiter can't support life because they have extreme weather conditions, temperature, and pressure. And there are no building blocks that might create life. But smaller terrestrial planets, such as, I don't know, Earth, have more key ingredients like oxygen and liquid water. Plus, they have more temperate weather and other conditions. And still, not all of such planets support life, of course. It's not easy to find a planet with similar conditions as the ones we have on Earth, or at least the conditions that would allow life to develop there. But meet Kepler-22b, one of our most promising findings. It's 600 light years away from us, twice bigger than our planet, and with temperatures of about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a so-called super-Earth. It's a category of planets unlike any we have in the solar system. They're more massive than Earth, but still lighter than ice giants such as Uranus or Neptune. Super-Earths can consist of rock, gas, or a mixture of these two. Kepler-22b is within the habitable zone of its parent star, which is less bright than our sun. The planet probably has a rocky core. It may have an ocean, but it doesn't host any life. At least, we don't know about it yet. To check this out, astronomers have discovered an exoplanet they're calling Super Saturn. It's got rings over an AU wide. An AU is the astronomical unit, the distance between the Sun to the Earth. That's an incredibly huge ring system, hence its name. Super Saturn is being called Mamajek's object after the astronomer who led the team to whom we owe the discovery. Professor Eric Mamajek of Rochester University in New York found Super Saturn while scouring through data downloaded from Wide Angle Transit Observations. WASP is the acronym for Wide Angle Search for Exoplanets. It's an ingenious project developed in the year 2000 by astronomers at Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland and St. Andrews University in Scotland. Using four telescopes, the CCD video cameras on the scopes record the slight dimming of starlight caused by objects passing in front of stars. This is called the transit method of exoplanet detection. 
So, for example, the planet Venus transits across our view of the Sun every couple hundred years. A black dot, the silhouette of Venus, is visible, crossing in front of the Sun as Venus passes between our line of sight and the Sun. This tiny eclipse causes the amount of sunlight coming to Earth to be reduced by a minuscule amount, also known as teeny tiny. The same is true for all the stars in the Milky Way that have planets going around them. Exoplanetary transits in front of stars must be in direct line of sight with Earth for the starlight to be dim. Such transits do not occur very often. That's why thousands of stars must be looked at simultaneously for as long of a duration as possible, between 4 and 8 hours a night. WASP was created to stare continuously at as wide of a range of stars as possible. Maybe one of them would show an exoplanet transit. That translates into a lot of data being produced, about 40 gigabytes per viewing session. Computer scientists at Leicester University in England developed a computer program to store the data and generate photometric graphs of the light intensity of each star. Open University, also in England, joined the WASP project, took this data, and made it available for research by astronomers worldwide. The graphs of the intensity of starlight show that changes in its brightness are called light curves. These graphs have two axes. One is in the timeline axis, the other one is the intensity of light. As the object, considered an exoplanet, though it could also be a brown dwarf star, crosses in front of the star, the timeline axis keeps track of how swiftly it is moving. It tells us how close the object is to the star, while the brightness axis keeps track of how much the starlight dims. This way, we can find out how large the object is. Now, obviously, big objects will dim the light more and be easier to detect. At present, Earth-based equipment is not sensitive enough to measure the dimming caused by planets as small as Earth. Neptune's size and larger ones are the limit for WASP. However, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is now in operation, has a much greater sensitivity and will be able to resolve the transits of Earth-sized exoplanets. Now, I know you want me to get to Super Saturn, but there's something else you should be familiar with before we get there. If the exoplanet has an atmosphere, or, in the case of Super Saturn, a ring system, the starlight from the star the planet is transiting will shine through the atmosphere or ring system, and that can be detected too. The light curve will show less dimming in the photometric data, because not all the starlight is being blocked. Some light is still getting through the atmosphere or rings. This is important because it gives astronomers a reading of the atmosphere. The James Webb Space Telescope is fitted with spectroscopes that can determine the gas content of the transiting exoplanet atmospheres – oxygen, methane, carbon, etc. The WASP project has been really catching on. There's a super WASP project now consisting of WASP North and a WASP South. One looks at the sky above the northern hemisphere, the other looks at the sky above the southern hemisphere. There's also a next-generation transit survey, NGTS, based on the WASP project. It's automated, so astronomers don't have to stay up all night sipping coffee, but they can if they want to. Located at the European Southern Observatory in the Atacama Desert in Chile, the NGTS scans millions of stars and has discovered over a hundred exoplanets down to a size as small as three times the size of Earth. NGTS has started a Planet Hunters Club on social media. Citizen scientists can search the online database of light curves and perhaps discover your very own exoplanet. What had been a strictly British effort started by one or two astronomers is now a worldwide phenomenon. With the ability to read the spectroscopic signatures of atmospheric gases during exoplanet transits, a new idea emerged – techno-signatures. That is specifically identifying gases in exoplanet atmospheres that are produced by civilizations. The James Webb Space Telescope can do this. Gases from pollution, such as chlorofluorocarbon CFCs, can be seen spectroscopically if present. Tritium from fusion reactions, if they have them, can also be detected, along with heat patterns from cities on the planet's surfaces. Technosignatures is a recent concept that originated after the WASP project started. Who knows what it will turn up? Now, let's get back to Super Saturn. 
The star that Super Saturn orbits is J1407, a small, dim, sun-like pre-main sequence star of the 13th magnitude. Huh? Well, the human eye can only see stars to about the 6th magnitude, and each magnitude is two and a half times dimmer than the previous one. So it's not an exceptional star, just another telescopic star out there in the Scorpius Centaur region of the night sky. J1407 is a young star that hasn't yet settled into its stable, long-duration phase. This is important because Super Saturn, officially J1407b, is showing signs of having a ring system in an early stage of development. Super Saturn's light curve was tucked away in the mountain of data from the Super Wasp project. Professor Eric Mamajak and his associate, Matthew Kenworthy of Leicester University, studied the data thoroughly and produced a detailed report on it. Knowledge depends on good data. The horizontal axis of J1407b's light curve, the time axis, is what's causing all the hubbub. It took Super Saturn weeks to transit across in front of its parent star. 56 days, to be exact. Planetary ring systems that we are familiar with in our solar system orbit right around the equators of the gas giant planets and are very thin, from only a few meters thick down to a few centimeters. In a telescope, Saturn's rings will seem to disappear when the planet is at zero inclination toward Earth. Saturn must be inclined at an angle in relation to Earth to see Saturn's beautiful ring system. It's something everyone should make a point of seeing. Saturn in a telescope. If Super Saturn's rings block most of the light from J1407 for 56 days, it means that the planet had to be orbiting at a steep inclination to its star. If it were at zero inclination, we wouldn't see the rings blocking any light. Therefore, the orbital time could be determined, 10 years minimum to 200 years if the orbit is highly elliptical. The superplanet itself is calculated to be 24 times the mass of Jupiter, which means that if it is gaseous, it could be a brown dwarf star. Super Saturn appears to have a Mars-sized object orbiting around it, because there is a huge gap in the rings that was most probably cleared out by a large object. The Cassini division in the rings of Saturn is where the moon Mimas has cleared out a path through Saturn's rings. The light curve of Super Saturn has only been observed once. All the exoplanet detection systems are keeping an eye out for it to come back around J1407. No one knows when that will occur. Some astronomers have suggested that J1407b is a brown dwarf star system in itself, merely passing in front of, but not connected to, star J1407. An orbital reappearance of Super Saturn would disprove that conjecture. The center region of Super Saturn blocked out all the light from its primary star. This is what indicates that the ring system is new and in an early developmental phase. Over time, the very dense ring mass close to the planet is expected to thin as all this matter gets absorbed into the planet or ejected into space. This is what has happened with our solar system's gas giant planets. The Mamajek object is a shocker. Never before or since has a light curve been detected like Super Saturn's. Super Saturn has added a new chapter to our understanding of the formation of ring systems. So, here's to you, Super Saturn. Hope to see you again soon. Now, Jupiter used to be flat and look like an M&M candy. Now I'm hungry. And it wasn't the only flat pattern in our solar system. Turns out, there are tons of things that can go wrong during a planet's formation like locking up to the sun or getting whooshed into open space. Let's check it out. The Earth isn't flat, but Jupiter might have been. Instead of being a big round ball, gas giants in our system might have started more like flat pancakes. Jupiter is one of the oldest of our neighbors. It's 4.6 billion years old, just like our sun. And when it was just a baby planet, it likely formed through a process called disk instability. It all begins with stars. When a star is forming, it doesn't look like a round object. It's more like a big disk of stuff. During this stage, really hot winds made of charged particles blow out. The dust in that disk contains stuff like carbon and iron. Some of them collide and stick together, forming bigger objects. Dust turns into pebbles, pebbles turn into rocks, and rocks bump into each other, getting bigger. 
Gas in the discs helps all these solid bits stick together. Some break apart, but others stick around, and they're the ones that become the basic pieces of planets. They're called planetesimals. Even gas giants like Jupiter started off as tiny specks of dust, smaller than a human hair. Eventually, they formed their own big ring-shaped disks of gas. They began to spin around our sun, growing bigger by gathering gas and rocks like snowballs. Gas giants are special. They were born from the colder parts of the disk. In cold areas, molecules are slower, which makes them easier to grab. In these places, water could freeze, and tiny ice pieces stick together and are mixed with dust. These dirty snowballs gather up and then form cores of huge planets, like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. In the warmer areas closer to the star, rocky planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars start to form. After the icy giants were born, there wasn't much gas left for these smaller planets. It might take tens of millions of years for these rocky planets to form after the star is born. And our sun was growing at the same time, sucking up nearby gas and pushing far away stuff even farther out. After billions of years, the disk changed completely, turning into a round star with a bunch of planets, dwarf planets, asteroids, moons, meteoroids, and comets around it. Recently, simulations showed that these protoplanets, as these early dust balls are called, don't start off looking like the planets we know. In the case of gas giants like Jupiter, they look more like squashed balls or M&M's candies, not the peanut kind. When the sun was young, the disk of gas and dust surrounding it cooled down and became unstable. It started breaking into big chunks. These chunks dramatically collapsed together under huge gravity to create Jupiter. It became a round gas giant over time. There are a lot of oddities that can happen during that process of planet formation. Ever wonder why Venus or Uranus spin in the opposite way compared to other planets? Usually, when things form from a spinning disk of gas, they tend to spin in the same direction. For example, if you spin a bunch of balls on a string, they all twirl in the same way. So, theoretically, all planets should spin in the same direction too. But there are a lot of fast-moving objects, like comets and asteroids, in our solar system. When they smash into planets, especially during their early days, this collision might send the planets to spin in the opposite direction. Venus and Uranus probably survived a massive collision. Luckily, they weren't repelled to outer space. The gravity from the Sun and nearby planets pulled them back into place. There are also so-called tidally locked planets. These are celestial bodies that spin in a way where one side always faces their star, while the other side remains in perpetual darkness. So one side is always very hot, while the other is extremely cold. Hmm. If we were on a planet like that, we would only be able to live on a thin line in between. These planets form when they're very close to their star. The gravitational forces are extremely strong, and over time, these forces slow down the planet's rotation until it matches the time it takes to orbit the star. Imagine you're spinning in your chair. Someone comes up to you and, holding onto your chair with their hands, starts spinning with you. This way, you'll always face each other. Tidally locked planets kind of work like that. Our moon is tidally locked to our Earth, which is why we only see one side of it. We've discovered more than 5,000 planets outside of our solar system called exoplanets. Some of them have very strange orbits. For example, planets with incredibly long orbits, thousands of years to make one trip around the star, or very wonky, comet-like orbits, or so-called hot Jupiters. They're super close to their star, way closer than Mercury is to our Sun. But these planets couldn't have formed where they are now. As their solar system evolved, they changed their positions for some reason. This rearranging is called planetary migration. There are three main ways this migration happens. First, because of the gas and dust spinning around the planet. When a planet is bumping into this stuff, it can create spiral patterns in the gas. These patterns can either push the planet closer to the center or farther away, depending on how they mix together. It's called a gas-driven migration. 
This is what Jupiter experienced when it moved closer to the Sun billions of years ago. I wasn't around then. This also explains the existence of hot Jupiters. Second, big planets can shove the smaller ones, changing their paths. Third, the star's gravity can tug on the planet, making its orbit more circular. Ever heard of rogue planets? Imagine a lonely planet floating in the vastness of space without a star to call home. They're like the wandering nomads of our galaxy, doomed to drift around forever. And there are so many of them. There might be more free-floating planets than ones that are tied to stars. We're talking trillions of rogue planets hanging out in our Milky Way galaxy alone. They're often as massive as our biggest planet, Jupiter. But most of them might be Earth-sized. Some might even have thick atmospheres that keep them warm, even though they're far from any star. Some of them might have wild auroras, while others could host moons with liquid water, a potential haven for life. There's even a chance that they might contain extraterrestrial life. These planets might bump into other stars or even entire planetary systems as they journey through space. Sometimes they might get caught in a star's gravity for a while before getting flung back out into space. But how are they born? Sometimes, during this chaotic process of planet formation, not all planets can manage to stay close to their parent stars. Some of them get kicked out of their solar systems due to powerful gravitational interactions with other planets or passing stars. These ejected planets become rogue planets. In 2012, astronomers found a solar system from the very beginning of the universe. This system included a star and two planets. We called it a fossil system. The star is super old, about 13 billion years, almost as old as our entire universe. It was mostly made of just hydrogen and helium. This is unusual because planets usually form from clouds of gas that contain heavier stuff. That's when we figured out that the way planets formed before was different from how they form now. We know that stars with more metals are more likely to have planets. In astronomy lingo, metals means any chemical element other than hydrogen and helium. But in the early universe, there weren't many metals. Most of them were created inside stars and then spread out into space when those stars blew up. So when did the very first planets form? This newly discovered system helps answer these questions. Its two giant planets are orbiting a star that's incredibly low in metals and extremely old. This should be really rare, if not impossible, but they exist. This means that maybe there are more planets in metal-poor systems than we thought. Studying them will help us learn more about the history of planet formation.